Good morning, Crossroads, and all those who are watching this morning. We would want to welcome you to our Sunday morning service. And we are now in the situation where we are not having services in the building anymore. And we are only having an online service, which means that we are back to where we were, but we are going to continue sharing God's Word. And I trust that you will be blessed this morning as we share God's Word with you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting, even if it's by virtual means. Lord, I bring before you each person who's watching. Maybe they're alone. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're going through hard things. Maybe they're longing for the privilege of hope for this new year. Lord, we know that New Year's resolutions don't do anything, but that we need the life of God. But Lord, we need to know how do we move into your blessing? How do we move into taking the promises of God when we have many challenges to deal with inside of ourselves? And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. On New Year's Eve, we shared a word all about what it's going to take to grow in the new year. And in waiting on the Lord, I felt impressed not to continue with that message, but to share something very specific that God put on my heart in the last day. And I'm really excited to be able to share it with you. It's a word called losing and saving. And a really important word that I believe will impact our lives together. So let's jump into God's word together and let's trust God that um, we will do it. And the first thought that I want to share with you is that we as people are in desperate danger that we don't realize we don't take seriously and we think we're okay but actually there is a very serious danger in our lives and it's not just COVID but there is spiritual danger and we need to be aware of it and move into the place where we are out of danger and into the will of God. So I want to talk about that and I want to say the danger is that we can lose everything that matters to us. And that danger exists every day. And in doing this, sharing this word, I want to begin with reading some scripture from the, the, the book of Joshua, chapter 7. And I'm going to read a story that I'm sure would be of interest to everybody. Let's read the story together if you want to get an, your Bible out and read it along. In Joshua 7 it says there, But the children of Israel committed a trespass cons regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So what had happened, if you read chapter 6, this is just after the battle around Jericho and they've had this incredible victory when they walked around the city and they shouted in praise and the walls came down and um, Joshua had warned the people, don't go in and take anything of the city for yourself. If there's any gold or silver or metal, um, that's brass or iron that needs to go into the common uh, the common sort of um, kitty. But don't keep anything for yourself because the Lord has said that there's a curse on those things. But there was somebody that ignored that instruction and thought that they could get away with it. And when Israel attacked the next city, the city of Ai, they lost it. They lost the battle even though it was a much smaller city. And the Lord revealed that somebody was keeping these things for themselves. So this is how it goes. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is besides Beth-Avon on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but just let about two or three thousand men go up and attack. 
Ai. Don't weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from before the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads, and Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us. And cut off our name from the earth. What will, we do, will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you any more, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come up according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord, God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me what now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered and answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing fifty shekels, I coveted them and took them, and there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver and the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? Now you wouldn't understand that question. But that was the name of that valley. It was called the Valley of Achor, which means trouble. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with a the fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor till this day. Now what a terrible story, and, and it's, it's a story that lets us think, you know, wow, God is extremely serious about things that uh, people can be lost, and one asks hard questions. For example, why did the so-called children and all the, the, the family have to die for Achor, at least uh, for Achan, for his sins? Um it must have been so that they, the family knew what had been taken. And they were partly responsible. But it's also a picture of mankind. That all of mankind has died, has been lost. 
due to the sin of one man, of Adam. It's a picture of that principle that all of us are lost through one person's sin. And um, it's, a, it's a hard story to, to, to tell. And you will wonder, what on earth is that relevant to us? Well, I'm going to begin to share a story about that. And I'm going to go straight to Jesus speaking. And then you will begin to see how very relevant that story is to us this day on the first Sunday of the year of 2021. So let's go to the scriptures again. And let's jump into Luke chapter 9, and then we'll touch back into the story of Achan. I'm reading from Luke chapter 9 and verse 18 through to 21. And it happened, as he was alone praying, that's Jesus, that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now I've got the cross-references to the, the similar accounts of the same stories in the other Gospels. But this part is... He's, Jesus tells them very clearly who is going to reject him, that he is going to be killed and that he'll be raised on the third day. But it seems that when it all happened, they didn't remember it, that Jesus had explained in great detail what would happen to him. But here we continue. Jesus continues talking about what's going to happen. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in the, his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now, we all know this passage in Luke chapter 9. It's a key scripture where Jesus talks about the price of being a disciple. And it's one of those scriptures that we'll read it and we'll realize there's a big thing in this. But how do we actually live it out? How do we apply it? And if it's so important, what do we do with it? Sometimes we read scriptures and we say, well, I, I realize that this is very true. How do I apply it? Well, we're going to talk about that very practically. We're going to look into the scripture, break it open a little bit, and see what the words are actually saying to us. So I'm going to begin with that and uh, come back to that. And I'm going to touch over some of these verses and uh, reading back again, Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So we're going to look at that in a few moments. But this verse is where I'm going to begin. Verse 24, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Now, in our English it doesn't get anywhere close to understanding what this phrase means. It says there, whoever loses his life. Now, if we talk about loss or losing something, I lost my keys. I lost uh, my hat. Uh, there was a time when um, as a family, we were traveling in a boat and the wind blew somebody's hat off and it disappeared into the water. The hat was lost. It appears that you can lose your life. But if you read this verse, it's not a passive idea. 
this losing, and it's the word apolumi, to lose your life. And this is the crunch word. So I want to jump into the crunch word right in the beginning of this message. Jesus says to them, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And this is the, the heart crunch of the message that we're looking at this morning. Now, if you understand the word, uh, how many of you have heard the word Apollyon? If you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, or you've heard of um, uh, Apollo, it relates to this, the destroyer. Um, Apollyon, or Apolese, it means to put out of the way entirely, it means to destroy. So I'm going to use that word destroy in this phrase and it makes a little more sense if we read it. It says there, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will destroy it. How about that? It's not will lose it as in, a, as in you know what, I went to the shop. My wallet fell out of my pocket. I don't know where it went. It's not a passive loss. You have to destroy your life. You have to reject it. You have to say, I am getting rid of. I am breaking this life. I don't want it anymore. I'm rejecting this life. It's not passive. It's doing something active. You have to lose your life. But then it says, but whoever loses or destroys his life for my sake will save it. Now that's not a, a recommendation to kill yourself. That's not the point. Let's look a little bit deeper into this. What does it mean to destroy your life or lose your life? What does that mean? And uh, there is this, Jesus explains it. He says, what profit is to a man... If he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. So there we see destroyed or lost. Both words are written in the text. And uh, we will see that if you can gain the whole world, you can own all the, the wealth of the world. And then you die. You leave it all behind. Everything that is of value in this world and in this time... We see those, the rich and the wealthy, flaunting what they have. Making it look like they are very secure. But we've also seen some of the wealthiest in this time being defeated by powerful diseases, by hard things. I remember not too long ago seeing one of the, the great uh, tech, tech uh, giants dying of cancer and not one thing could be done in spite of the, the millions and billions available at his disposal to save his life. There are limits to what money can do and when you die you leave it all behind. Where will you go and what would you, you have with you? That is on a surface level. That's the, the first idea we're, in, we're looking at here. But Jesus takes the scripture and when we look at this word, he says there, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And then it's got this word, uh, whoever loses his life. So that same verb appears in two consecutive verses. And, well, in two consecutive phrases, yes. Now, you have... Uh, let's look at the, the, the Greek a little bit. It's that word apolese. And it's it's a third person aorist. Now, I hope this isn't too complicated. But in English we have past, present and future tenses. And we could also have a continuous tense. Which tells you something more about it. Now in Greek we have the past, we have the present, we have the future, simple but there are a lot more tenses, and one of them that they have 
is a tense called the aorist. And that's the tense that's used here. And aorist isn't just talking about uh, time, as in past, present, or future. It talks about aspect. That's a complicated grammar idea. But it's talking about how often does it happen. Does it happen repeatedly, or does it not say how often it happens? And that's what this verse does. It's an aorist. And it just says that if you lose your life for my sake, you save it. So I want to understand how to save my life. So I've looked at this word very carefully. And I need to lose this life. I need to... And it says it just needs to be done. Um, a little bit higher up in the passage, Jesus says, Take up, to let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And I get the sense that I keep, need to keep on doing this, lose it, but every time I do it, it's sufficient. It's enough. I need to lose my life. Now, let's look a little bit deeper and start understanding what is meant by that. Um, what does Jesus mean? Because if he says that if you don't do this, you're going to lose your life, it's kind of important. If Jesus says it, and it affects my eternal destiny, I need to know what he meant by it. So let's look at that together. Now, the next idea that we have over there says, you will, he says there, if you desire to save your life, you will lose it. Let's look at that word to in, in that text. Now the first word is, is um, teleo, which is the word there, desiring. And that word, whoever desires to save his life, the word there, it, it's talking about making a choice. But it's not just choose left or choose right. It's a heart desire. It comes from deep inside. It's my will. My will is involved but it's something I really want. It says, whoever desires, chooses with their heart to save his life will lose it. So I need, if I'm going to choose my life, what is that life that I'm choosing? What am I doing? Now I want to save my life. So here we see this, this word is the word sozo, which means to deliver or protect, to heal, preserve, to save, do well, make whole. If I want to fix up my life, if I want to heal all the brokenness, if I want to be saved, if I want to go to heaven, if I want complete restoration, that word sozo describes it. If I want to save my life, I must lose it. Now you're going to be saying, Pastor, you've lost it. What are we saying? I'm mining into this passage, into this verse, so that we can get to the heart of what Jesus is saying here. This is an important verse. So let's look a little bit deeper. He says there, and this is the challenge, we all want the save part. But we don't love the conditions of the save part. What are the conditions involved? We don't understand the lose or destroy your life part. I want to grab a hold of what Jesus says here. But I need to understand what that means. And in order to do that, I need to go back a little higher up in the passage and look at another word. And that's the word, if anyone desires to come after me, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily what does you do there are in fact jesus says there are three things that we need to do if you want to come after me if you want to come after me which you would have to do to be saved three things number one deny yourself now where do we find that word deny yourself it's a very useful word an interesting word and we find that used in the story when jesus is about to be uh, tried 
and Peter standing in the courtyard and uh, he keeps on saying, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. And the third time he says, I don't know the man, the cock crows. And then Jesus looks at him and he knows he has been busted. He denied that he knew Jesus. And Jesus knows, he knows Jesus knows that he's on his own. And he feels heart sore about it. He feels broken that he's denied the Lord. It's the same word used there. And it means to renounce or to disown, to abstain from it, to let go of it, to say, this isn't part of my life anymore. So I'm, I get the sense, because this is in context, losing my life has something to do with denying myself. It's saying, as far as Patrick goes, I'm going to put my life on hold. I'm going to put my life over there. I'm going to give it into God's control. I'm going to say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, that's what it's going to be. I'm putting my life at your disposal. And that's a hard thing to do at times. Because you put your life at God's disposal. He uses your life as He sees fit. You might have had plans for certain things. But God has better plans. And you know that you're in the middle of His will and doing the things of His kingdom. And he says, then deny yourself. Now, and then he says this next phrase, take up your cross daily. Now, that word cross is a very interesting word. Uh, the word stauros, it means a fence post. If you went to a old-fashioned wooden fence, the bit of the fence, that the wooden paling that goes into the ground, the word for it was a stauros. And they used a stauros to crucify people on it. Now, we don't know exactly how Jesus was crucified. Uh, it actually, the word stauros means a stake, literally like as in a wooden stake. Not a meat stake, a wooden stake. And they would have put Jesus onto it, nailed his hands up. Uh, some people say he did that. But there were alternative ways to nail somebody like that. Certain people were nailed in an X formation. We know that Peter was nailed upside down. Now, it was actually a very, very cruel form of punishment. And it was invented of all people by the Phoenicians. The previous occupants or, or the, the, the people who lived in what we now call Lebanon were Phoenicians. And their practices spread to the Mediterranean, to the Greeks, and to the Romans. And they did it to the absolute worst of the worst criminals. Rebels, robbers, uh, highwaymen. Uh, the people that society considered the worst were crucified. It was a mark of great shame to have been crucified. Interestingly enough, if it came from Phoenicia, that was a nation ruled by idol worship, by Baal worship. And it's interesting that the enemy would have uh, sort of had, had his ways of being cruel going to the Roman Empire. And it comes back. And the enemy thinks, yes, I'm going to do this to Jesus. I'm going to humiliate him. I'm going to break him down. And God the Father just waits. And Jesus is, lays down his life as our sacrifice. And when Jesus dies and he commits his, himself to the Father, I think at that point the, the, the enemy realized what happens. Especially when Jesus was raised from the dead. And then he knew. The Bible tells me if he had known what he, would have, what he was doing in, in supporting this, he would never have crucified the Lord of glory. That was, that's the star of laying down his, your life. Now we are told that we have to pick up our staros, our stake, and carry it to, in following Jesus. And the challenge in 2021 is, how do I do that? What is it going to mean to follow Jesus? Does he want me to die? You know, we're in a time when Unfortunately, we have the tragic deaths of so many people. Is that what God wants for me? And I want to tell you, that's not God's best.
but what are we looking at? Let's carry on reading. Let's, let's mine into this part. The, there are three things to do. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow me. Now, where was Jesus going? Now, I read to you the first two or three verses of this passage where Jesus was saying, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be uh, found guilty and judged by the, the, the elders and the scribes and the high priests. And they're going to kill me. And then I'm going to be raised from the dead. So he's saying, you're going to follow me. So obviously we are following him to his death. Sorry if that sounds like not such an exciting message. But there's life in this message. There's joy in this message. This is, the, this is the good news of the gospel. Can you believe that good news can sound so terrible? But we're looking into the word here. And I, I trust if you love God's word, you'll see these parts. So he says, your life will be saved if you destroy everything that you have that's of your old life. Saying, And this is where it starts coming in. What in your life? I'm going to look at that word life. That word life is going to give us a clue. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But this is it. All your secret sins. All the things that relate to your life on earth that needs to die. Maybe you have backup plans to manage without God. Maybe you have secret disobedience. Maybe... You, are, you have things in your life that you know you cannot take to heaven. Let's come back to that in a minute. But let's look at that word life like I spoke about. He says there, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. What is it? You know that there are three words usually used for life in the New Testament. One is zoe, which is the word we would use in if you, Jesus says, if you come to me, I will give you life. That's Zoe. That's that abundant life. That's the God kind of life. That's a good life. That's the life we want. But here we see that there are two other words. There's the word bios, which is animal life. It's the physical life of your body. It's like uh, a cow or a chicken. They don't have everlasting spirits. They have... A kind of a life, but it's not the God kind of life. And then we have the third word, which is the word psuche. Now you might see that word there. I don't know if you can read that. That's the word psuche. We get the word psychology from it. And psychology is a, is a word that speaks about the mind, the, the soul. Now, we know in, in the Bible that it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, it says, I pray, God, that your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless till the coming of our Lord Jesus. Now, we know that as a human, you are a spirit. And that's the part of you that has the God kind of life. But there is a soul. And that soul is really a suche. It's your mind. It's the soulish part of your being. And that soulish part, it's the, uh, it's life, it's a kind of life other than the born again life. It's the part of you that's not born again. Now we all know that when you get born again, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away, old things have become new. But we also told in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, present your body as a living sacrifice. Verse 2 says, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your Mind. Now that word mind is the word noose. Um, and uh, we would trans spell it something like N-O-U-S, mind. But that's all part of the psuche. It's part of your soulish part of you. And it's a self-centered life. It's got to do with me and my will and the part of me that manages my life. And so we see in the part here... I'm going to read that verse that we read just now and put that idea into it. And let's see if we can start putting together what this verse is saying to us. Let's see if we can read it again. And I'm going to jump across. Let's just go straight back to that verse. He says there, verse 23 and 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his... So it's deny, that's reject 
your selfishness, take up your cross, that's an instrument of death, and follow me. For whoever desires or wills or chooses from his heart to try and save or give salvation to his, now this is where the word comes in, psuche, your soulish life, your selfish, self-orientated life, you're going to lose it. But whoever loses, what does it say? Loses or destroys or casts aside or rejects completely his psuche for my sake will save it. How about that? We're starting to put this together that there's a part of me that can't go to heaven. There's a part of my identity which needs to be abandoned. There's something about me which God cannot abide. And you can probably start seeing from where this is going to go in connecting to the first story that I looked at. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and destroys himself? Let's go on to that. So what do we lose? You lose your life that is outside of Christ. Anything in your life that can't be part of your life with Jesus needs to go. And I'm not going to tell you what that is. You know, and Jesus knows, and he's going to tell you what that is. If there are things in your life that's controlling you, that can't go with you. And it not only needs to be just lose it, it needs to be actively lost or destroyed. What things are in your life that cannot go with you in following Jesus? What things, if they do go with you, need to go to the cross? What things need to be put to death at the cross? That is now the crunch question. It's like moving to a foreign country. Last year we saw a number of very dear friends and folk that we knew left our country and went to another country for a season. And they had to get rid of everything they had except a couple of suitcases. And when they came back, then they had to start putting their possessions together again because those things that they had had were no longer with them. If you're going to heaven, you can't take anything with you except other people. You can only take precious things with you. Things of eternal consequence. Physical, earthy things you can't take with you. So we say to it, why hold on to those things in our mind and in our lives that are wrong and sinful? Why should we hold on to those? You can't take it with you. That is the story. Let's go back to our story of in Joshua. Now, here we see the story where Joshua is speaking and uh, by supernatural means they've identified Achan as the culprit for the loss against Ai and also the breaking of the covenant with God. Um, they were warned, there were conditions for the covenant, they were not to worship anybody, any other gods, they were not to disobey the Lord and they've disobeyed him. And it is so bad that they are now going to lose all their battles unless they bring forth those things which need to be destroyed. Do you know that there are things in our lives that can be just as dangerous? Things in our lives that keep us from God's destiny. Where we are refusing to walk in God's will. And we are rejecting His ways. And God is saying, I want you to love me first. And if you love me, you keep my commandments. It's not out of obeying the law for the law. It's because your love needs to be there and His grace needs to be there. And we can talk about grace in a few minutes. But what is it in your life that is so bad that it can destroy your life if you can keep it? These are the words of Jesus. This isn't some strange guy. This is, these are the words written in red in your Bible. And Achan... And uh, had kept three things. Babylonian garment and some gold and some silver. And because of it, they couldn't take AI. What was the problem? You see, there are three common sins. 
The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three areas where the devil catches us. And the Babylonian garment, if a garment came from Babylon, Babylon, anything that came from that, where it would have been identified, it would have been a spiritual power garment worn by people who used the Babylonian spiritual world. The Magi, the, those kinds of things, and a Babylonian garment would not just have been something pretty, it would have had supernatural significance. So there was, if you wore that, it was held that you had demonic supernatural power. That, what was the thing that was appealing about why you wouldn't lose it? It gave you spiritual power. Then there was what, what, what Achan had taken was a lot of silver. And silver is normally in small lumps, small bits. There was lots of silver. What It would have been wonderful just to buy this and buy that and please the flesh. But then there's this huge lump, this wedge of gold of great, great value, which would have been a significant source of wealth. And it would have made him feel very secure if he had that wealth. He could buy and trade. He could borrow against it. It would have been something very useful. And this is what appeal, appeals to, the, to, to human beings. There was this covetousness. And then he looks at the stuff when he, 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 you see that he would kind of have gone into the battle, walked into Jericho and said, Wow, what a beautiful garment. I don't think I can actually burn this. I can't. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to just stick it somewhere. And this gold and the silver, you know, there's so much here. Let me just keep a little bit for myself. That covetousness grabbed a hold of him. How many of us don't struggle with covetousness at times? Wanting things that are not God's will for our lives. And this is what happened to Achan. Jesus spoke about a very similar story. He spoke about rich people, how dangerous it is for rich people to go to heaven. Um, it said, he said it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who know a little bit about it, that in the, the, the cities of the time where they had walls around it, uh, at night they closed the big gates, but there was a very small opening that somebody could come through if they were felt to be safe, but they had to leave all their possessions outside because it was a very narrow little thing. They couldn't take wealth. They couldn't take their camels. They couldn't take their horses or valuables. They just had to, they could just go through themselves. And that's why we have the story. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's what that little opening in the wall was called than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's a picture of this. And you know what? Many people wanting to go to heaven, but they want to live the life they want to live. They want to be living as unto the world, controlled by the world's values, and then also have salvation. And Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you need to let everything go. Repent of sin and come and follow me. And it's a challenge because... This is where it goes. And you say, how do I do this? Um, and Jesus had said, these things which are impossible, men are possible with God. And he spoke about that. And I'm not going to go into that. But what is it in your life that should be lost before you can be saved? Number one, it's coveting. Number two, it's sexual sin. It's living to the flesh. And this is the other one. It's the need for control and security. Life wrapped up in ribbons and bows. Everything neat and tidy. And we want control in our lives. And we have to instead say, God, I'm going to give you absolute control in my life. I want to read a last scripture. And, and this is in, the, in an advert book. It's the book of Hosea. This is where we start getting the victory. And this is where we start saying, how do I get saved? How do I get some hope? And very interestingly enough, if you understand where the valley of Achor is, it was just uh, to the east of Jericho, where that heap of stones stood. And it was actually the part of the land that when you came into Israel, 
You came in and as you looked out over this valley, you saw this beautiful green and wonderful area. But right at the beginning was this test and it became the valley of trouble. And Hosea speaks about this valley and he says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, I'll bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. He's speaking about Israel. He's the bride of, of the Lord. And I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. The valley of Achor is a place where Achan was executed. But that place becomes a, pl a place of hope. And when you come to Jesus and when we come to die to self, we deny ourselves. We put Jesus first. That is the step where we begin to move into hope. And it's a beautiful picture where we take our covetousness, our desire to be controlled, our deceitful secretiveness, the things that we thought nobody knew about but that God knows about, that would actually have resulted in our death. But Jesus stepped forward and took the place of us as Achan and died for us for our sins. That's what really happens at the cross. So we can see that we are saved by grace through faith. That's why we follow Jesus to his cross. He died for us there. Our sins are nailed there. We die to sin there on the cross. All our sins are there. And we are raised to new life in Jesus. And this is an incredible message. It's an incredible idea that we and all our self has to die on the cross and if you as somebody wants to go forward with Jesus and follow Jesus, this is the thing that has to happen in our lives if we want God's blessing in our lives, that we have to deny ourselves, follow Jesus, and go into the place where God wants us to go. It's We are raised to new life through the cross. And it's through repentance, and then we get reconciliation with the Father. Now, the challenge that I want to bring to you today is this walk away from the dead corpse of Achan walk away from the dead stuff in your life put your eyes on Jesus don't go back and start scratching in those stones to look for that gold that would have been a stumbling stone you rather put your eyes on Jesus keep walking with him keep following Jesus and let him be the one who's guiding you and taking you forward into a new life that as you follow Jesus remember following Jesus through the cross leads to the the uh, the empty tomb it leads to that life of great victory and eternal life with Jesus and if you lose your life with Jesus you find new life the God kind of life you lose that selfish soulish life and it gives you a new kind of life the Zoe kind of life, the God kind of life. So I want to encourage you to follow Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Father, I thank you for your wonderful word, and I thank you that you're speaking to us, giving us new life in your word. And we trust you, Lord, to help us, bring us into the, the best that you have for us, Lord. And Father, I just really bring my life before you and each person who's listening, that each of us today will hear God's word and bring everything that we've hidden under the ground in our tent before you. Every deceitful thing, every hidden thing of darkness, everything that we have in our lives that doesn't belong, that will be a stumbling stone for God's best in this year. And Lord, we bring that all before you and we say, Lord, won't you take, won't you take it? We know we need to be in a new covenant with you. That we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But in Christ Jesus we have a new life. And we give you our lives and we ask Lord, won't you please restore us, renew us and forgive us for all the times that we've let you down. And Father we thank you for that, that as we go on with you, we walk into the victory and the blessing of our future with you, in Jesus' name. Amen.